Last Sunday, um, we were in Colorado and I was watching Mike stand here and uh, Glenn talking at length. I don't know what was going on. And then, boom, I lost the whole thing. So, But I don't have to worry about that today because I'm here with you. And, uh, Mike with no mic. <laughs> it's always good to have a wit among us. Good to see all of you. Are you saying I'm crazy? Louder? How about now? Is it louder? Well, we have certain Baptists who are on the back row. <laughs> Glenn, are we ready? We'll turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to read this morning, among some other verses, verses 33 through 37. And the title of the lesson, following what we've done the last, I believe, three lessons, is Christ explaining the law, truthfulness, and oaths. But before we get into it, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this time that you've given us uh, to open up your word. What a treasure it is, and we use that word often, uh, but not uh, in an exaggerated way, certainly. We consider this to be our great treasure, a gift from you. Thank you for uh, speaking to us. Thank you for giving us instruction. Thank you, thank you for uh, telling us who you are and revealing yourself to us. What a, what a blessed gift that is. And we're mindful, uh, as always, that apart from your active participation in what we're doing by your Spirit, uh, this is a, a useless exercise. Uh, but we know it's not because you are among us. And uh, so we are, are thankful for that and pray your blessings upon the ministry of the Word today, both in this hour and in the, the following one, and as we uh, remember our Savior in the Lord's Supper. Bless the Church of Jesus Christ Universal uh, today, and uh, we specifically pray for our members. I won't go into the individuals uh, that especially need our prayers, but we've seen those requests and we know of them and we, uh, we ask that you give much blessing, much mercy, uh, that you hear uh, the pleas of the saints and you respond as you always do in perfect wisdom, uh, faithfulness, and mercy. So, thank you for this time. Bless now uh, as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. It's important uh, in our study that we remind ourselves that in this Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus was giving instruction to disciples on what kind of persons they ought to be, what they should look like, what their character should resemble. A great theme of the sermon is that Christians ought to be different than those who are not followers of Christ. And when we are, we will have an influence on the unbelieving world. We're in the section now in which Jesus is explaining various precepts found in the law of Moses and identifying the perversions and misinterpretations of the law circulating among the leaders. Beginning in verse 21 of chapter 5 and continuing to the end of the chapter, he gives examples of how more is expected out of a disciple than merely adhering to the law's statutes. It's not enough, for example, uh, to not murder uh, someone. Uh, rather, a disciple of Christ should be a reconciler, a merciful, forgiving, and a peacemaker. It's not enough simply to avoid a physical 
adultery. Rather, a disciple should be pure in heart and mind and, and zealous to cut things out of our lives that might cause us to stumble. A disciple will revere the institution of marriage and keep the marriage vows. And now today, uh, with verses 33 through 37, uh, Jesus offers up truthfulness as a characteristic of the Christian. So we want to read this short excerpt out of the sermon, uh, but also the Old Testament passages uh, Jesus had in mind in addressing uh, this very important topic. So uh, beginning verse 33 of Matthew 5, uh, uh, the familiar formula, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Well, we will uh, discuss uh, the background of these references to these various places or, or things people in his day were swearing by. But I want you to notice first that the scripture he quotes from in verse 33 is not a verbatim quotation from any single Old Testament passage, but instead an allusion to several uh, that were intended to prevent false swearing and making a vow and then breaking it. And the following were almost certainly the scriptures that he had in mind. I'm just going to read them. You can look, look them up if you want, but I'm not going to read them very quickly. Leviticus 19 verse 12, you shall not swear falsely by my name. Now that's simple enough to, to understand, but at the same time we should note that by implication, such a thing as swearing by the name of God in order to attest to the truthfulness of a statement was a legitimate practice. What was prohibited was swearing falsely by God's name. And then there's Numbers 30, verse 2. <clears throat> if a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself, he shall not violate his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And again, we note that such a thing as making a vow or taking an oath was not in and of itself uh, frowned upon, only violating it once the oath was made. And then finally, Deuteronomy 23, verse 21 and 23. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you. And then verse 23, you shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. And there are other verses, too, that we could turn to that the Lord may have had in mind, but these are the primary ones, and the issue is truthfulness and oaths. The human race has always had an uncomfortable relationship with truth. In the creation account in the book of Genesis, uh, we're not told how long it took, but very quickly, it seems, uh, Adam and Eve were confronted with the first perversion of truth. And the account, you, you all know the account very well, the account leads us to believe that they warmed up to it quite easily uh, did God really say the serpent challenged Eve? Die? You surely will not die, he fibbed. And so the lies began, one after the other, from generation to generation. The Bible, in fact, gives us something of an illustrated travelogue of the history of untruth. Abraham prevaricated. So did Isaac and Jacob. Jacob's 12 sons were historic liars, with the exception of Joseph. 
Many of God's most faithful servants often played fast and loose with the truth. Think David uh, with Bathsheba. And so it was throughout the Bible's history until that fateful day when he who was the way, the truth, and the life came face to face with self-serving Pilate and the powerful man who believed he held Jesus' very life in his hands dismissively spit out to him, what is truth? Many believe that today we've reached the pinnacle of the irrelevance of truth. It's the age of relativism in which what is true is only a matter of any individual's personal opinion. There's a, a very popular online satirical website, I guess that's what we'd call it, Babylon B. I know some of you uh, look at Babylon B. Uh, it pokes fun at the absurdity of some of the uh, realities in our lives today. Recently they did a spoof on today's college entrance exams. Uh, the questions appeared and below them, as for decades and decades, there were the answers. A, B, C, but then a new one, D, my truth. Recently, I was at home for a week without my wife, and so I had seven or eight days in which I could eat and read and pretty much watch whatever I wanted to. So I watched the second part of a two-part documentary on Lance Armstrong, uh, the internationally famous uh, bicycle racer who won something like six or seven Tour de France races, but eventually had them taken away because he cheated and used performance-enhancing uh, drugs. Cindy had watched the first episode with me, but couldn't quite stomach a second. But I'm a glutton for punishment, so I wanted to see more. And my favorite bit of part two was when Armstrong was talking about a book he had written. I'm sure you've read, read it. And he was being challenged about the truthfulness of it. And he responded that everything in that book was the truth, except that part about doping. I mean, why is that important? But in contrast to today's disdain for what we might call true truth, absolute truth, Jesus taught that a Christian's words are to be absolutely truthful. He regarded it as paramount that what his disciples spoke could always be relied upon. And for that matter, it should not be necessary for them to have to back up their statements with oaths. That's the main idea of our passage in a nutshell. Either let your yes be yes or let your no be no. And anything beyond that will have its source in evil and not good. It was not necessarily a new teaching by Jesus, but reflected the mind of God from ancient times. It was his wisdom found in Proverbs 3, verse 3. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. And that concept was found in the Old Testament law. And Jesus now, in the context of setting forth the true meaning of the law, summarizes the various passages which we've just read in order to make his point. Using the same formula he's used throughout this section, he takes issue not with the commands themselves, but with the false applications that had been made uh, of them. So in verse 34, look there, the Lord objects. But I say to you, make no oath at all, and then he goes on to offer up some of the various misinterpretations that were in vogue at the time. So you'll notice uh, he has mentioned in verse 33, vows, and now in verse 34, an oath. And we should take just a, a moment to define what those are precisely. 
A vow is a promise to do or perform something or not to do something. That's a vow. Uh, the oath is related to a similar verb uh, to swear. The, the swearing is the action and the oath is the content. So the oath is something that is invoked when a person calls upon God or, from, or, or, or some other human, superhuman being or sacred object to witness his vow and to punish him if he breaks it. And the purpose of all this swearing to God and vows to do something was to ensure truthfulness or to make the truth of a matter all the more sure. It's always been so, and the reason for that is what we said at the beginning, that it is part of our sinful nature that we just have difficulty always telling the truth. We, ought, we might almost say we love to lie. The lie can be a handy way to pry ourselves out of predicaments that we've gotten ourselves into. Anybody ever done that? The lie is a way to adorn our reputation when we are acutely aware that it needs some boosting. Lying can give us that little extra we think we need to obtain the advantage we hope for. There are just so many situations in which lying seems to work in our favor, while being truthful seems not to. The challenge, as we've all experienced, is to not get caught in the lie. And because most people understand that every person we encounter has larceny and deceit lurking in his heart, the great mass of fallen humanity has come up with these artificial reinforcements like the bizarre oaths and vows that Jesus mentions to provide assurance that the lie that they are promoting is really pure truth. But the vow and the oath in and of themselves are not what displease the Lord. Now, we do read here his objection in verse 34, but I say to you, make no oath at all. And some people read that and attempt to wring from it a prohibition against taking oaths in a courtroom or, or swearing allegiance to a country or to a cause, uh, but they misunderstand the Lord's meaning. Jesus always pointed people to the scriptures, so... Uh, we should look there as well. In the Old Testament, people were permitted to take oaths, uh, even in God's name. I'll read you one. De Deuteronomy 10 verse 20 states, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. In the New Testament, we could have read others. There's one. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul regularly swears by God's name, calling God as his witness in Romans 1 verse 9 and Philippians 1 verse 8 and in other places as well. God himself swears not to send another universal flood, to send a Redeemer, uh, to raise his son from the dead, he swears, Psalm 1610. When Jesus came and was put on trial in Matthew 26, and uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, demanded of him by oath, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus responded to him uh, when before he had kept silent. But the most telling example in the Bible comes from the stirring account in Genesis 22 of the reiteration of the Abrahamic covenant in which the Lord declares, by myself I have sworn, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. And the author of Hebrews, you may recall, reflects back on that scene in chapter 6 
of the epistle to the Hebrews, noting that when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Because he wanted to illustrate the unchangeableness of his purpose, so the author says there. He interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. One of the great verses in the Bible, we overlook it sometimes. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul. So all this swearing and oath-taking that we read about in the Bible is designed to encourage truthfulness and the assurance of truth. Oaths were allowed. It was the violation of oaths that was condemned because it undercut the truth. But by the time of Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount, as with almost everything, the practice of vowing and swearing had fallen prey to abuse. Uh, the Jewish scribes had constructed detailed instructions about which vows and oaths were binding and which were not. Uh, the purpose uh, was not for edification and truth, but in order to devise means of evading the truth while yet avoiding recrimination for it. These were clever uh, men in the ancient days. Uh, William Barclay was one of the first of the commentators who helpfully categorized these abuses. Uh, the first was the use of frivolous swearing, uh, taking an oath for the most minor of matters and unnecessarily invoking some authority or another. On my sainted mother's grave, I swear this, that, uh, or the other. Or improperly and impiously vowing, as God is my witness, I never did such a thing. They're frivolous oaths uttered without thought, but only in order to persuade others of what is in fact an untruth. The other abuse was evasive. Uh, swearing, using specific wording in order to avoid being bound by it or to, or to cover up a lie. Uh, the contemporary teaching uh, was that unless the name of God himself was specifically mentioned, the oath was not binding. This is what Jesus was referring to uh, here. Uh, people would swear by heaven or or by earth, or, or by the great city Jerusalem, or the like. And, and later they would claim that they weren't bound by what they had promised because they had not used the name of God. This is what I did when I was a kid uh, growing up. I, I had a best friend, and we had, uh, whenever we wanted to find out if the one was pulling the other one's leg, not telling uh, the truth, we had a tried and true method. So we could promise, we could swear, no, I swear it's true. Uh, we could call in witnesses, but when one of us asked the other, do you swear to God? The game was over. We, we had to tell the truth. There was no evading that. But God, uh, rightly understood, is in everything. There ought to be. Uh, swearing by heaven uh, about something that's not true doesn't relieve one of God, of guilt, for heaven is the throne of God. Likewise, swearing by the earth, it's the footstool of his feet, or the same with Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. So these first three misapplications Jesus describes all have to do with God, but then in verse 36, he shifts the focus to the person of the swearer, nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. And probably what was meant was that the person swearing would give his head, that is, give his life, uh, for if we were not speaking the truth. 
But even here, uh, the Lord's challenge is centered on God, for only God is able to change the color of one's hair. I'll just leave that thought <laughs> sort of floating in the air for you. It's been a theme here during the pandemic. The point is, as in all of these examples the Lord raises, the scribes and Pharisees jerry-rigging of the law's commands in order to avoid their true intent did not relieve them of the actual righteous demands of their holy God. If a person would be his disciple and yet engage in such disingenuous games with words, then Jesus will simply abolish oaths. For a true follower of Christ, there should never be the need to swear an oath before making a declaration. Instead, every statement of the Christian should be yes, yes, or no, no. And anything beyond that, the Lord says, is not just not good, it's evil. Well, it is particularly interesting to me that the only other place in the Bible that we find this particular way of articulating truthfulness, this turn of a phrase, yes, yes, no, no, is in the epistle of James. The author of that epistle is James, uh, the oldest half-brother of Jesus. And in the 12th verse of James chapter 5, we find this. Above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. I can only think uh, that James was profoundly influenced by the utter truthfulness of his older half-brother as he observed him from childhood. He never lied, nor, as Peter would le later say, was any deceit found in his mouth. His yes was always yes, his no always no, and James knew it to be true by a lifetime of experience. The Christian's word should be thoroughly reliable and never require an oath or a vow in order to give the assurance that it will stand. We should say what we mean and mean what we say. We have an obligation to promote truth. That would include the truth of the gospel, naturally, but we should also radiate personal truth and not pretend to be who we are not. We should promote political truth and ethical truth. And by that I mean public policy truth and moral truth. Uh, politics can be ugly and demeaning. Uh, whether it's more ugly and <laughs> demeaning today than it ever has been, somebody else can be the judge. But Christians should strive to rise above the vitriol and insist on speaking truth in love. The world needs our influence. All of us here, the world needs us. Uh, Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. And we're to have a preserving influence in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, in our schools, wherever we are. We're to be, uh, have a preserving influence when it comes to all this vitriol uh, that consumes us every day, that we meet with every time we turn on the television or open the newspaper. These deceptions that pervade our daily experience. We need to stand for truth amid them, truth amid the lies, truth amid the falsehoods. 
John Erickson is a name that some of you will recognize. He is the cowboy author of the famous Hank the Cowdog uh, book series. I know, uh, I bet many of you have read them, have read them to your children, your, your, your grandchildren. In 1985, uh, one of the major television networks made an animated cartoon out of Erickson's first Hank the Cowdog uh, book. Now, in Erickson's books, you remember uh, Hank, his ranch, it is a, a family cattle operation involving a husband named Loper, a wife named Sally Mae, and a hired hand named Slim. Loper and Sally Mae have two children, two dogs, and a cat. And their ranch is a typical cattle operation like you'd see here in Texas. Well, the network version uh, replaced uh, the cattle ranch with a chicken farm. I don't have that much problem with that, but uh, I like both. Uh, but Loper no longer ran uh, the farm. Sally Mae suddenly became the boss. Loper and Slim were merely her hired hands, and there was no suggestion of marriage or of a family unit. The children had disappeared from the story, and one could only assume that Sally Mae and the men lived together in the ranch house, one big, happy, postmodern family. The network, Erickson later lamented, used my teacher-trusted, family-tested story as a carrier for its feminist, beef-hating agenda. Well, some of you may hate beef yourself, so, but you get the point. Of course they did. Uh, that was 35 years ago. 35 years ago, when the cancer of duplicitous, dishonest untruth has metastatized in our modern world. It's why we continually observe that every perversion of truth is magnified far beyond its actual reality. But we <clears throat> have a continuing role to play in it. We are to be its light. Our yes must be yes. Our no must always be no. On my walk uh, yesterday morning, I saw a number of the same signs in the front yards of some of the homes in, in the neighborhood. Not Biden and Trump signs, but the, the same, I, I think, put up by a local church, these signs. Three or four houses had them. And at the bottom of the sign, there was a message. Hashtag be the church. Be the church. And that's the message of our passage this morning. Be the church. Uh, look like the church. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Uh, bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. We have this most important mission it's to be the person Jesus Christ describes in Matthew 5, verse 37. We are to broadcast yes when the message is yes and no when the answer is no. And anything beyond that, don't miss this, is evil. Anything beyond that is evil. Now, no one, uh, no teacher should enjoy uh, pointing a finger and accusing another one of evil. But the message comes from the Lord, and it is directed toward each of us this morning, all you truth tellers that I'm looking at here. Be truth uh, purveyors. Shine the light of truth. That's the Lord's challenge to us this morning from this section of the sermon. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for truth. 
uh, what a uh, terrible existence we would have were it not for the assurance that you have given us that there is truth, that you are true, uh, you never lie, you never change. Uh, you've told us that, and you have set forth in your word pure truth that is reliable, that does not contradict itself, uh, but that can be depended upon. And Lord, we ask because uh, we confess this morning we are all liars ourselves. And by that, I don't mean uh, that that is the bent of our lives, but uh, we fall, we stumble, we catch ourselves uh, not being entirely truthful. And so as we live the Christian life and as we uh, can continue to read your word and pray and enjoy the ministry and the fellowship of our church, we ask, Lord, for the sanctification that only you can give to make us more truthful people. And that would be truthful uh, in the face of the lost people that we come into contact with, uh, that they would know uh, truth or, or, or at least hear truth, whether they recognize it or not, uh, but, but that the, the light that we shine, the salt that we are, uh, will indeed be, as we said, a preserving influence in our world. Our world needs it. Uh, we pray your blessings. We pray your mercy upon our country, upon our cities, upon uh, this world, uh, that truth would prevail. We know it will in the end, and we look forward to that. Uh, what a wonderful triumph of hope uh, that truth will prevail. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.